Hello, my name is Nancy Lavoy, and this is my presentation level health education intervention presentation. To start out this presentation, I would like to review the background and its significance. My target location for this project was Silver Lake. Background of this community includes over 31,000 people distributed over 2.75 miles. According to the LA Times, it has one of the largest percentages of incomes of less than $20,000. Close to 65% of the population rent their home. Graffiti is noted in the neighborhoods, homeless camps, minimal health centers, no social services, very crowded neighborhood, and no police station in the neighborhood, to name a few. The population in this neighborhood is mainly Latino at almost 42%, while Asian, Black, and other comprise the other 25% and white are at 34%. With all the disparities in this neighborhood, it was my decision to focus on prevention, since in return, I thought this would have the highest impact to this community with poverty and lack of resources being my deciding factors. Therefore, my focused interventions were influenza, childhood obesity, diet, and physical activity. These are the Healthy People 2020 objectives in which cover my intervention classes of influenza, childhood obesity, diet and physical activity. They include immunization and infectious disease, diabetes, physical activity, nutrition and weight loss, early and middle childhood, and health-related quality of life and well-being. There are more than four objectives here because some of the topics uh, do overlap objectives, which I will go into detail later on in the presentation. The needs assessment started out with a windshield survey, observing the community, assessing its attributes and its challenges as a whole, seeing what is needed. This allowed me to see what the community was lacking, what resources did it have, what were the people's concerns and highest risk factors. Second, interviews with community stakeholders, for example, a nurse from the community, um, a priest from a local church, an emergency department director from a local hospital, neighborhood council members, and of course, members from the community. Interviewing these people allowed me to view things from their perspective since they live or work in this community and you know, ask the question, what do they think the problem is? The pre seed proceed model provided us with a framework in order to plan our health education promotion intervention programs using both an ecological and educational approach. This allowed us to identify a problem and then develop our desired outcomes. There are eight steps to this model. I will use my childhood obesity topic as an example of the framework. Uh, for example, step one is defining the outcome um, in which the community, it's what they want and what they need. Um, the community here wanted healthy children because they considered their children to be their future. Uh, step two is identifying the issue where we find issues and the factors which affect them. Uh, a lot of it was like behavioral, for example, um, do people have the willingness to change for the better, um, you know, or like their lifestyles, um, how that affected their disparities, um, resources, um, you know, for example, this place had farmers markets um, and reasonable supermarkets. Uh, in step three, examining factors, we identified the factors which will affect the community's behaviors and environmental changes. Um, this mainly referred to predisposing factors like lack of knowledge, uh, cultural beliefs, for example, that like chunky children are healthy children, um, confidence to provide change, reinforcing factors like community resources, um, and people which are willing to help and promote change. Step four is identifying best practices. Um, and this is pretty much, you know, decided that education on childhood obesity for both children and their parents would be beneficial. Um, and then you just want to make sure that the facility matches um, your interventions. Step five um, is implementation, also known as just the intervention. This is where we actually do our classes. Uh, step six, the process evaluation, which evaluates our procedure of what we were planning to carry out. Step seven, the impact evaluation is what we're doing, what it thought we would, thought it would do. Um, and finally, step eight, the outcome evaluation is, um, is what the community wanted done in step one being done, um, all of which we will review them in more detail in the following slides. 
So education and practice, I broke this up, this slide into both assets and barriers when it came to education and practice. Um, so to begin, these are what I considered assets. Uh, they may be different in other given situations, but when it came to the community that I assessed, this is what I concluded. Um, behavior. Um, what can support our goals are the willingness of the community members to promote change. Is it in their best interest? Do they understand the need for the change? Um, resources. I consider this an asset as well because it appeared that they had the means. You know, the stakeholders were willing to help out and facilities were willing to help out. Um, they just needed to be tapped into. Um, of course, you know, these resources do have their limitations, but it was a good start. Uh, when it came to barriers, I considered the lifestyle to be a barrier. Many neighborhoods and communities have a, life, a lifestyle on top of like the individual family's own lifestyle. Um, so for example, in Silver Lake, the lifestyle was very much focused on culture and art. And I felt that that can be hindering when it came to other priorities like childhood obesity. Um, and some families with children, for example, are working families of either one or two uh, parents and their lifestyle might just be to try to get by day by day, um, you know, and just, and just get by and pay the bills. Um, which can also be hindering to any kind of goals, I feel. Um, and last, the population. I mean, can they read? Do they have a home, transportation? Can they speak English? I mean, pretty much anything that can be categorized as a disparity um, can be a barrier to learning. And this was definitely a community that had uh, lots of disparities. So now we'll begin reviewing my interventions. Through the pre-seed proceed steps, it was mentioned that there was an extremely high percentage of hospital ED visits and hospitalizations due to influenza. So this in return um, highly affects the, the community and household incomes and community resources and you know children and schooling. So you know for the parents it affects their work days. You know they need to take their kid to the hospital. They you know it adds stress. It predisposes them to other health risks. Um, it may already affect their low income and potentially you know by losing their job. Uh, to the hospital, you know, it increases ED wait times. Uh, I won't mention how this affects the nurses or the rest of the hospital staff, but, you know, for the community, it may increase the number of those families who don't want to wait to be seen. You know, they can't afford to be in the ED for 12 hours. Um, therefore, it increases their risks of hospitalizations needed uh, because they wait until the child, you know, or any adult for that matter, um, is too sick. Um, and then they get brought in. They require more extensive treatments. Um, you know, uses up uh, resources, uh, state money, and so forth. Um, this also affects a child's learning since a child, you know, must be absent from school or may not be paying attention at school because they're sick. Um, or if they don't go to, you know, like the ED or the hospital and then they go back to school, they may get other children sick. Um, so it just affects all the children and, and their learning and their schooling. And these are just some examples and proof that show that the, just all these factors affect each other and that it's truly just a vicious cycle. Um, the 2014-2015 season was moderately severe with high levels of hospitalizations and high percentages of deaths attributed to pneumonia and influenza. Therefore, Healthy People 20, except 2020 uh, has recognized this as a problem, sorry, and was able to, um, uh, which falls under the immunization and infectious disease objectives. Uh, the objectives I had placed for this class was to understand what the flu was, uh, to be able to list signs and symptoms, at least three of them, list two ways to prevent the flu, um, and state how to wash their hands. Um, with this flat class, I felt it was very important to help them understand this on a more personal level. Um, I did have mostly kids for this class and reading a story about a child who was sick, I think helped them understand, um, you know, that it does happen to them and it allowed them to be engaged at least for the rest of the class. The story had some key points like uh, going to the school nurse, uh, proper rest, drinking water and not playing with friends while you're sick. I made sure to teach some basics first since they were children. I focused a bit on germ transmission and using an activity of passing long glitter which allowed them to comprehend the concept of germ, bacteria, virus transmission. Um, one of the main focuses as well was proper hand washing, which allowed for another activity and having them sing the song Happy Birthday twice while practicing to wash their hands. Um, I provided the center with some hand sanitizers to encourage the children to use them. Although we did emphasize that, you know, soap and water is the best way to wash your hands, but that it's not always feasible. So hand sanitizer was the next best thing. Um, since I knew ahead of time that it was mainly children, 
in this class, I did provide the facility with some handouts on influenza for the adults. Um, I felt the children really benefited from this intervention because they got them thinking about other illnesses that are also contagious. I had some kids ask me about Ebola, um, you know, and good bacteria versus bad bacteria and eating healthy while you're sick. Um, since these are all comments and or questions they had after the class, um, it was good. So here I have childhood obesity and the ultimate goal here was to minimize the risk for childhood obesity by promoting healthy eating and or healthy choices. Um, through interviews, it was described that the focus on children was a top priority for this community because they are their future and it was easier to teach new habits rather than break old ones. Um, according to the Center for Disease Control, the childhood obesity has more than doubled in children and surpassed that in adolescents over the last 30 years. Um, and although there has been some attempt on a more government level to make these changes, it's not really seen a lot in local community level. Uh, for example, there's a lot of programs which focus on infant and mother health and well-being, learning and healthy eating by the age of five. Um, you know, but what about after? Or the emphasis on eating healthy in hospitals and schools, but you know, what resources do these families have when they go home? Um, minimizing childhood obesity will hopefully allow the children to grow up you know, with healthy habits and minimize their, their, their health risks, uh, not only as in children's and as teenagers, but as adults as well. Um, so this topic fell under the objectives, according to Healthy People 2020, of physical activity, nutrition and weight loss, and early and middle childhood. Uh, the objectives that I had set for this class was to recognize one healthy habit to change, like diet or exercise or limiting screen time, know how long children need to exercise for, um, how to plate a plate, which is an activity about having all the food groups in your plate, and the ability to list at least two risks, which can be avoidable due to healthy eating and exercising. Um, this group was also mainly children, 72 to be exact. So based on that audience, I did have to alter my original teaching points and emphasize a bit more on food groups, healthy versus non-healthy benefits to eating healthy, and how that correlates with needing energy for your body uh, to play so your muscles and your bones can grow up to be healthy. Um, we also reviewed what it meant to be healthy. Um, we took some time to have the kids, you know, think of their own version of healthy meals, like adding bananas and strawberries to their cereal. Um, and uh, I provided the children all with uh, snack sacks to go home since their pickup pick time fell between uh, lunch and dinner. Uh, I provided an apple, some raisins, and a bottle of water. Um, and along with some parent handouts, um, because, you know, I, I could have taught this to the kids, but ultimately their parents are responsible. So the booklet had information about childhood obesity, along with, you know, recipes for healthy snacks and how to promote these healthy habits. Uh, diet, with there being a lack of health care coverage in the community, and since I couldn't provide that health care, um, the next best thing I can do is just to educate them on incorporating a healthier diet to their lifestyle and how diet can affect their chronic illnesses, especially diabetes and hypertension. With this community being a higher percentage of, you know, the poverty level and being mainly Hispanic and Filipino, I felt their diet usually consists of not so healthy options for the diabetic and people with hypertension. Therefore, the people were more educated in regards to how their diet can affect their health. They may be more inclined to make these changes to their diet. The objectives I had here was uh, to know what hypertension and diabetes, diabetes is, is uh, list ways to eat better, name two other lifestyle changes to decrease your chances of uh, diabetes and hypertension. Uh, since this class was targeted towards adults, it was a bit easier to cover the content of the class. However, because they were adults, um, you know, it's not, one shouldn't assume that they already know the basics. So I did take some time at the beginning of the class to, to assess the audience since, you know, these are random people um, in regards to their language, understanding of what may be assumed throughout the class. Um, for example, do they know what diabetes and hypertension is? Um, you know, what is healthy eating? Uh, most of the audience have the basic understanding. Um, you know, one lady like did uh, speak mainly Spanish, but she said she understood English pretty well and said she would ask me for clarification of anything if she needed um, after I did mention that I spoke Spanish. Um, therefore, it made the rest of the class uh, very easy to follow. Um, when we covered the healthy eating portion, I made sure to incorporate some healthy alternatives to culture foods, um, you know, brown rice over white rice, choosing white meat if possible, canola or olive oil versus lard. Um, we also made suggestions like 
limiting very traditional, you know, high fat, high sodium, high sugar, you know, high everything um, recipes, perhaps to just special occasions or holidays, acknowledging that it's okay to occasionally have them, just not all the time. Um, and I also emphasize on other forms of healthy lifestyle, like incorporating activity and maintaining um, healthy weight. The last one, uh, physical activity. The ultimate goal here would be to improve the quality of life through exercise and decreasing their chances of acquiring illnesses. Um, you know, many of this population being predisposed to illnesses and not having any access to healthcare, as I mentioned in the previous slide. Um, prevention is really the only one thing that I, you know, I felt I can do. So um, I plan to educate the community about the role activity can play in their life, you know, preventing diseases and improving their well-being. The objectives here um, were to list three benefits of doing physical activity, to state the recommendation for their age group, list three types of activities, and mention at least one tip to encourage physical activity in their life. Um, what I made sure to cover in this class was physical activity, you know, always starting with the basics, its benefits of weight control, reducing the risk of cardiovascular disease, reducing the risk of type 2 diabetes, reducing the risk of some cancers like colon and breast cancer, strengthening bones and muscles, improving mental health and mood, all while increasing your chance to live a longer life. Uh, physical recommendations like attempting to do two and a half hours um, a week. Uh, many people thought that they needed more than that, which I think is um, on the emphasis that children need to do at least an hour a day. So I think they just assumed that they did too. Uh, lastly, I made sure to give some recommendations like invol involving families in activities, uh, you know, doing them together. Uh, doing activities in 10 minute intervals or participating in some sports or community classes, um, you know, like Zumba or weightlifting if they could at their local um, park and recreation centers. Um, handouts were also provided, which cover the education provided, plus resources like the American Heart Association um, and the Center for Disease Control and Prevention um, if they needed more information. So classes like this, you know, budget takes a big role on performing these kinds of projects in the community. Um, first off, we'd have to consider who would be teaching these classes. You know, nurses are not cheap, and if they're expected to teach them and get paid, um, you know, then the salary and the frequency of the classes need to be considered. It's always beneficial to look at other cost-effective ways to have such projects roll out. For example, in our hospital, nurses looking into climbing the clinical ladder must have community service fulfilled. Um, can these classes be voluntarily thought, assuming that they're benefiting the RN in the long run? Or perhaps working in collaboration with nursing schools who can have students fulfill these classes as part of their clinical experience and only have one RN oversee the curriculum of these classes being taught to the community? Uh, then there's also the locations of these classes. You know, where are, they, where are we going to teach them? Um, of course, some facilities may charge a small fee, whereas other facilities may be free. So perhaps collaborating with neighborhood schools, parks, libraries, or churches in which the cost may be potentially on the lower side can be beneficial. Um, last but not least, educational resources like handouts and booklets, I mean, are not cheap. And if compared to, um, you know, if we look at other, you know, especially if we pay like full price or something from Kinko's, um, you know, large companies are always willing to donate to nonprofit organizations. So this may be a project which, you know, compared to other donations, may be on the cheaper side for them. Um, or perhaps finding copy centers, which may offer a discount, um, you know, can also be considered. Bottom line, yes, we do always have to keep the budget in mind. Um, but it's also important to keep in mind that there are resources out there um, that we can use in order to minimize our budget requirement. Um, and allow us to give more for less. So outcome measurements. Um, Short-term goals, they evaluate the success of our intervention. Uh, these goals allow us to test whether or not we have served the purpose of our intervention. In other words, you know, did they learn what they were supposed to? Um, this may also be considered the seventh step of the pre-seed-proceed model referred to as the impact objectives. Ways to evaluate such short-term objectives are better done after the class, of course, only after finding the most appropriate way to evaluate your audience. Uh, for example, if teaching a class to a group of young adults whom you know are able to read, understand English, um, supplying a short test after the class or an evaluation form may be beneficial. Um, a concept like this may not work if your audience is, you know, homeless or of another language, for example, um, where we don't know if they even know how to read. 
um, you know, for one of my classes, there was a lot of children and the only way of really evaluating my objectives were by raise of hands, you know, asking questions and allowing multiple children to answer, you know, but in the search for different answers. Um, and I had reviewed all my short term goals and objectives in the previous slides. Long term goals evaluate the community outcome in the long run. You know, how have our interventions affected the community as a whole? Uh, did it really make a difference? This is the eighth step of the model and is also referred to as an outcome evaluation. Um, the evaluation of the long-term goals is a bit more complicated. Personally, I think they require a form in which we allow the change to be measurable. I will use my influenza teaching as an example. You know, one of the long-term objectives I had was um, the number of vaccinations, uh, to increase the number of vaccinations of preventable diseases. Um, this may be a very broad subject and it's like, what's, you know, is there really a way to measure that many vaccinations in the community or what's even considered a preventable disease? However, perhaps an objective like decreasing the number of admissions diagnosed with influenza would be more feasible where a percentage can be attained prior to the interventions and another one after the period of six months, for example, at a local hospital. The long-term goals and objectives I've set for my interventions included reducing the proportion of children ages six to 15 who are considered obese, increasing vaccination rates for those preventable diseases, increasing the amount of people who are diagnosed with diabetes whose blood pressure is under control, decreasing death rates of, diagnosed, of those diagnosed with diabetes, reducing the proportion of adults with high blood cholesterol levels, increasing the proportion of children and adolescents age six to 14 who view television, video games, um, or play video games for no more than two hours a day, and as with any project, uh, continued evaluation of one's objectives must always be done um, and altering those interventions as necessary. Speaking of evaluations, now we have results and conclusions. To summarize the main points, I think concluding a proper assessment is key to successful intervention planning. Um, weaknesses I personally encountered was timing um, to be one of the top ones, you know, feeling rushed to develop such interventions, being summertime where the audience perhaps was just ready for summer vacation, you know, plus it was hot out, people were just looking places to be kept cool. Um, for future projects, I think, you know, it'd be beneficial to just like stick to one subject where we can build on information, you know, cover the same topic, um, but in different populations, for example, if I would have stuck with like influenza, like going to a senior center and talking to them about how influenza may affect the older population are going to a free clinic and seeing how it affects those with chronic illnesses or those who are pregnant, you know, going to a school and, and talking, you know, about it with children and how it affects children and what they can do. Um, and then just focus on, you know, different places and different audiences, but all within the same topic. Um, and definitely consider some of those budget ideas, you know, or bringing help with me. Um, you know, such as other students or colleagues who are looking for volunteering opportunities. Overall, it was a great experience and a great learning experience that would help me uh, in my professional career, hopefully. Um, it, was, it was a good experience. Um, here are my resources or my references. Um, and thank you very much.